Classroom. My name is Erica Ombre from NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. Jennifer Mint, also from NOAA's Ocean Acidification Program, will be our producer working on the back side to keep Adobe Connect going. If you have problems with Adobe Connect, please enter it into the chat box on the upper right of your screen, and we'll try to address them. Thanks for joining us today. Today, our webinar is entitled, A Marginal Fee of Variability in Ocean Acidification and Harmful Algal Blooms in the Gulf of Mexico, given by Beth Stoffer. This webinar series is laying the foundation for a virtual workshop on August 11th through 13th, where we will discuss harmful algal bloom and ocean acidification interactions, the major questions surrounding them, and what research priorities can help address gaps in our understanding and management of these factors. This is number five in the series of webinars to prepare for our virtual workshop. The workshop will help us identify priorities and research products that could be incorporated into a future request for proposals on the intersection of harmful algal blooms and ocean acidification. If you are not yet signed up for that workshop but would like to participate, please contact Maya Sharp, whose email is in the chat box. I'm going to let Maya Sharp introduce herself and share a little bit about her summer project with us. Maya? Thank you, Erica, and good day, everyone. I am Maya Sharp, a NOAA Educational Partnership Program undergraduate scholar, and I'll be completing a project based on webinars content, questions, and discussion. The chat box will be monitored and recorded during webinar, and there will also be a questionnaire we will use to inform our workshop and future directions of research funding. Those accessing the webinar online will have the opportunity to comment, ask questions through the Google form, and the link is in the chat box for discussion at the workshop. I'll compile these and synthesize them for our workshop. Thank you, Maya. We'll just take a few moments to get oriented to Adobe Connect for those that are new. Audio is over the computer. So you're welcome to listen through your computer speakers or a headphone or headset. If you are having trouble hearing, you may either try turning up the volume on your computer speaker, headset, or turning up the volume in Adobe Connect. And you can do that by accessing the top menu bar, clicking the pull down arrow to the right of the speaker icon, and selecting adjust speaker volume. And if you are on a headset, you can go to that same speaker icon, hit the pull down, and select the speaker to find the headset you are looking for. If you are still having trouble hearing, as Erica mentioned, please log off and log back on um, and enter Adobe Connect using the application rather than the browser. As we move into our presentation, um, you can view the presentation in full screen mode by uh, finding the button with the four arrows in the upper right hand of the slide presentation. So right up there. Um, this button does toggle the slides larger or smaller. You will lose the chat and captioning boxes in full screen but can toggle back to the regular view at any time to ask questions or add comments in the chat box. We do ask that you enter any questions you do have into the chat box shown here, and we will hold those questions until the end of the presentation. Also note that we'll be sharing any relevant links in the chat box. As you can see, a few have already been entered there. And um, we will take, uh, ask a few moments, you know, Maya mentioned her questionnaire, and we do ask that you each take a few moments to fill that out after the presentation. At the end of our presentation today, we will open it up for questions and discussion. If you want to comment but are not the questioner, please raise your hand, shown here in the smaller orange square. and. Um, we will see you and unmute you so you can continue the conversation with our presenter today. We will be posting a recording and a PDF of the slides on the workshop webpage, and that address will be in the chat box momentarily. And a link to that questionnaire will also be on the website for viewers to send any follow-up questions or comments after the webinar. So we really encourage you to take a few moments to fill out this questionnaire questionnaire so that we can have an informed discussion at the workshop.
and um, are given direction for future OA and HAB research. I will hand it back to you, Erica. Thank you, Jen, for helping us navigate Adobe Connect. And for those of you who are hearing two voices over the top of each other, please log out and log back in using the Adobe application versus the browser. All right, now to introduce our speaker today. Today we welcome Dr. Beth Stoffer. Beth is an assistant professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Her research focuses on understanding how dynamic, physical, chemical, and biological environments contribute to changing phytoplankton communities in coastal waters and what those effects mean for estuarine and marine food webs. Much of Beth's current research is set in the Gulf of Mexico, where her research team is studying how phytoplankton communities and the food webs they feed vary across gradients of ocean acidification, ongoing estuarine change, and as a result of extreme weather events. Beth is an early career research fellow with the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Gulf Research Program and a member of LUMCON Advisory Council, and the founder and organizer of the Science on the Bayou Informal Science Communication Series in Lafayette, Louisiana. Prior to joining the University of Louisiana Lafayette faculty, she was a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow hosted by the US EPA and a Lamont Doherty Postdoc Fellow at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University. Beth earned her Bachelor of Science with a double major in Marine Science and Biology at the University of Miami, go Kane, and her doctorate in Marine Environmental Biology at the University of Southern California. All right, Beth, take it away. Thank you so much, and thanks for uh, sharing the, the go, Kane, go Kane part of my, uh, my bio. Okay, so thank you guys all for getting on another of these excellent webinars focused on ocean acidification and HAB. Um, I'm presenting today on behalf of myself and my colleague Astrid Smetzer at North Carolina State University. Um, Astrid and I have been collaborating over the last uh, few years in a lot of work based in the Gulf of Mexico. So um, some of the some of the results that I'll share later from our work is, is collaborative between both of us. Okay, so um, to, to get started, I like to um, I like to kick off some of the, the talks I give about the Gulf of Mexico with this quote from Sylvia Earle, where she describes the Gulf as being the sea, uh, the sea that appeared to be a blue infinity, too large, too wild to be harmed by anything that people could do. Um, the Gulf of Mexico is a, a marginal sea, um, obviously fed by the uh, Caribbean Sea and the, the North Atlantic, um, but but we know that of course. Um, its location, its uh, proximity to the to North America and to all of the, the people and all the things that we do in North America is indeed having a significant impact on Gulf ecosystems and organisms. And uh, we'll share some of that today as it relates to um, ocean acidification and harmful algal blooms. Um, so to jump right in about some of what we know about ocean acidification in the Gulf, um, a recent paper uh, by Fabian Gomez used a, um, a regional biogeochemical model, um, high resolution model, to look at seasonal trends and kind of regional trends in um, OA parameters across the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the model results were validated against uh, measurements from uh, Gulf-wide cruises as well as buoys. And, and some of the things that this paper highlighted is that um, OA in the Gulf is, is driven by a number of different physical factors. Uh, at surface DIC concentrations, as shown in this, oops, sorry, I need to use the arrow, shown, shown in this map, um, are, are driven by several different factors. A lot of um, the DIC is correlated with temperature, and, um, and that's related to some of the upwelling regions off of the West Florida and Yucatan shelves. Um, but there are other factors at play as well in the Gulf. Um, on a seasonal, if we look seasonally, you can see that um, maximum PCO2 are, are measured in summer months, um, June, July, August, shown here in the lower left graph. But there are some hot spots that have pretty high um, PCO2 concentrations in other times of year as well. And of course, one of the, the big exceptions, kind of notable regions in the Gulf of Mexico is the northern Gulf of Mexico shelf. 
Um, this is where the combined Mississippi Atchafalaya River Delta system um, empties out into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this delta system or this river system is the third largest in the world, draining approximately 41% of the contiguous U.S. And so in this region, the DIC, the PCO2, are largely controlled by that runoff and variability in that runoff. Um, this work fits very well with what um, Kai et al. Have, have shown previously, which is that, um, and that some of the previous speakers, webinar speakers, have, have shown in other systems around the, the country and world, that this interaction between eutrophication and ocean acidification um, is, is really important for understanding OA in these systems. In the Mississippi River Delta, um, Kai attributed about a 0 0.05 drop in pH in this region to eutrophication. Um, eutrophication was enhancing the OA um, in the Northern Gulf region. And of course, these are also areas of high primary production. And so not only is eutrophication enhancing the OA, but it's also leading to a lot more variability um, through that primary production link. Um, so my focus is, is more on the, the HABs and phytoplankton communities. So we're going to um, transition into talking a little bit more about that. Um, the, sorry, the last slide that I had about the OA was that these are increasing trends. And um, uh, if we look over the last decade, we're seeing that, that subsurface DIC is increasing and importantly, is not captured in some of those surface measurements. Sorry, now we'll transition into some more related specifically to HABs and phytoplankton and their, uh, their response to OA. If we want to understand the biological effects of rising CO2 um, across uh, an ecosystem that's being impacted by increasing CO2, we have to do so at multiple levels of organization, from the individual organismal physiological response up through communities um, and ecosystems. And while there's a fair bit of research underway for a lot of calcifying organisms, such as um, reef building corals, which is what this Anderson paper is focused on, um, at a variety of scales, we don't necessarily see that as much with the plankton. And so um, what, what we're really trying to understand is, is how the individual organisms and populations, which is a lot of where our HAB research has, has um, falls so far translate into larger responses as well. Um, and so we're beginning to understand the impact on certain groups and species. Um, more broadly in the phytoplankton, understanding uh, the impact of rising CO2 on some of the calcifying members of the plankton, coccolithophores, pteropods, et cetera. Um, and there has been some work done on dominant HAB taxa. And um, some of the, the previous webinar speakers have, have covered some of those interactions between OA and HAB, and we'll be talking about more of those today as well. Um, we also have some information from kind of the population level, as um, model organisms have been used in lab or, or mesocosm-based experiments. And, and we've seen some you know, responses in um, kind of species, genera, classes of phytoplankton. We've looked at um, some of the winners and losers in, in those taxa with changes in, um, in the environment tied to carbon dioxide. So if we zoom in a little bit more to that species level and we focus more on HABs in the Gulf of Mexico, um, this map nicely shows how um, diverse the Gulf of Mexico can be in terms of HAB groups that, that we're thinking about and, and dealing with. Um, everything from the classical Florida red tide that is um, distributed throughout the, the Gulf, Crania brevis, um, some of these uh, other dinoflagellates like dinophysis, which is primarily um, in the western Gulf, or Gambier discus, a uh, benthic diatom, or dinoflagellate sorry, that's tied to um, coral reef ecosystems and more uh, dominant in tropical and subtropical waters. Uh, we see Pseudonycia, the toxic diatom, in some of the coastal waters. And then, of course, um, Aria, Aria umbra lagunensis, um, a, the, the Texas brown tide, 
that is found primarily in these lagoonal estuaries um, that are hypersaline in, in Texas. Um, one of the groups that's missing from this map, though, are the uh, toxic cyanobacteria, which more and more we're seeing in low salinity estuaries um, around the Gulf of Mexico. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that um, in today's talk as well. So I'm going to um, share just a little bit related to a few of these, these, these dominant taxa and what we know about their um, ecology relative to ocean acidification. And we're going to start with Crenia brevis. Um, again, Crenia brevis is this um, Florida red tide species that produces brevitoxins distributed throughout the Gulf. Um, blooms in the eastern and western Gulf have been uh, noted since the mid-1800s, although there are some, some suggestions that they were uh, documented by Spanish explorers even earlier off the coast of Florida. Um, but actually, these, these east and west kind of populations are genetically indistinct. So a lot of the bloom dynamics come down to you know, where these blooms initiate and then where um, the, the physical circulation kind of moves them. Um, interestingly, there are a few reports of Karenia brevis from those kind of central northern Gulf of Mexico waters, those that are heavily influenced by the Mississippi Atchafalaya River system, likely due to those salinities being generally below their optimum. Um, things that have been established over you know, many decades of research on Crania brevis, um, these blooms tend to occur in late summer through fall, although there are some years where they just kind of continue for a long time. Uh, and, and we know that there are significant ecological, human health, and economic impacts. And Barbara Patrick did a great job last week um, sharing some of the ongoing and then new monitoring methods that are being used to, to build maps, such as um, this one that highlights where cells have been detected and in what concentrations. Um, this monitoring investment has been matched by investment into forecasting. And so um, data from monitors, uh, sorry, the monitoring network, but also from um, the understanding of, of how blooms are transported and supported in coastal waters go into these forecasts um, suggesting where, uh, where risk is higher for people affected by toxins. Um, again, these blooms are typically in kind of summer and late summer and fall. And um, some, some great work out of, um, out of Florida has shown that they're, they initiate offshore primarily from um, cyst beds established from previous year's um, blooms. And then they're basically transported to the, the Florida coast um, coincident with upwelling uh, plumes. And so these typically occur again in late summer, early fall. And so we start to see some of at least these correlative relationships between upwelling, which is one of the drivers of OA on the West Florida shelf, and transport of this um, toxic dinoflagellate bloom. And that circulation in the Gulf is really then what also determines whether or not these blooms um, are, are just off the Florida coast or if they make it into, for example, the, the waters off Mississippi and further into the northern Gulf of Mexico. And when we start to then try and understand more of the uh, response of Crania brevis to uh, ocean acidification, we see that um, some work uh, out of uh, Lee Campbell's lab by Ray Herrera showed that um, a toxic clone of Crania brevis was able to grow faster um, at higher PCO2 concentrations, and that that response um, lasted even at higher than optimal temperatures. So um, Crania brevis does have a positive response in terms of growth rate to increasing PCO2. Um, that increased growth has been attributed subsequently to enhance the acquisition of inorganic carbon. When it comes to toxicity, a lot of the work has shown that um, the per cell quota does not necessarily change. There's um, more evidence for per cell quotas being um, tied to uh, different nutrient limitation, for example. Um, but as you have increased growth of toxic clones, the overall toxic um, toxin concentrations do increase as well. I think there, there are still several unresolved questions around Crania brevis, and this is, I think, where things start to get interesting. Um, Crania brevis, like most um, dinoflagellates we're learning, is mixotrophic, so it can use both kind of autotrophic and heterotrophic modes of nutrition. And um, this image is showing uh, epifluorescence micrograph of 
um, trenia with these little red dots are, the, are inducted retained synecococcus cells. Um, and, and so we know that it's not just functioning as an autotroph um, in, in the ecosystem. Trenia brevis blooms that, that initiate in the kind of offshore Gulf of Mexico waters have also been tied to um, preceding blooms of trigodesmium, uh, nitrogen-fixing uh, cyanobacteria in, in the oligotrophic gulf. And, and so, and this trigodesmium um, has been shown to provide a lot of the early nutritional content to perennia uh, brevis blooms in those early stages. And so we have to start to understand some of these um, other organisms that are important to perennia brevis, to its physiology, its ecology, but certainly to its bloom dynamics. In the case of trichodesmium, for example, um, most results have suggested, have shown an increased growth and nitrogen fixation with increasing PCO2. So how can we better understand um, some of these blooms and some of these species based on their, their ecologies in, the, in their communities? If we shift our focus for a minute to dinophysis, this is another dinoflagellate um, species or genera that, uh, that's in, found mostly in western, the western part of the Gulf of Mexico. Blooms of dinophysis were first observed in the Texas coastal waters in 2007, and um, work that Lisa Campbell's group has continued to do to monitor um, these populations led to the first shellfish closure due to a dinophysis bloom in 2008. This organism is also a mixotroph, um, and uh, it was only in 2006 that, uh, that uh, we were able to, that the community was able to start culturing this based on this mixotrophic feeding mode. Um, so ingesting ciliates that have fed on other cryptophytes is, again, an interesting component of this HAB um, species ecology. It's probably one of the reasons why there's very little or, or no um, information on direct effects of increasing PCO2 and the growth or toxicity of dinophysis. Um, it's only really been culturable since the mid 2000s, and, and again, it has this complex nutritional mode. Um, but if we look at some of the organisms that it is depending on, um, we can start to come up with some hypotheses for what might happen. Um, at least one study suggests that Miranecta rubra, the ciliate um, on which dinophysis primarily feeds, can be both indirectly and directly enhanced in its growth when you grow it in CO2 amended mesocosms and increase CO2 conditions. Um, so there's a suggestion that you know the organisms that dinophysis is, is feeding on is increasing. So what might that need, mean for um, dinophysis growth and toxicity um, in a future ocean with higher CO2, current and future ocean? Finally, if we focus on some of these emerging toxic cyanobacteria in uh, Gulf of Mexico estuaries, um, we, can, we can learn a little bit as well about these HAB groups and their responses to OA. Um, I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more about some of the toxic cyanobacteria in, um, in the Taka and the Great Lakes this later this week, I believe. Um, but Really, this is an emerging issue in estuaries worldwide. Cyanobacterial blooms are, are being documented in more and more systems. In the Gulf of Mexico, there have been large events over the past decade in Florida, Mississippi, Louisiana, and likely before then as well. Um, and these are becoming more and more annual um, events. So um, Bill Vargu's lab at LSU has been studying toxic cyanobacterial blooms in Lake Pontchartrain that occur more or less every year at this point and are tied to some of the freshwater diversions in the system. And one of the interesting um, uh, ecological kind of abilities that these toxic cyanobacteria are taking advantage of is not just the ability to produce toxins, but also to survive into low, um, low salinity and or brackish water estuaries. In Florida, um, waters from Lake Okeechobee that are heavy with nutrients, but also um, uh, toxic cyanobacteria populations themselves are influencing the, um, the water quality and, uh, and some of the, the issues in the Caloosahatchee River. This is an um, estuary near Fort Myers, Cape Coral on the west coast of Florida and, and has uh, instigated some of the monitoring um, that, that is being done in this system. Um, typically, we think of toxic cyanobacteria as have, or cyanobacteria generally as having highly efficient carbon concentrating mechanisms. 
And that suggests that, uh, and, and typically they're thought of as being really competitive in um, low CO2 environments for that reason. But um, some of the, the studies are showing that there's actually a, high, a fair bit of plasticity in how um, cyanobacteria, primarily microcystis, oregonosa, can um, acquire carbon, that carbon fixation is highly plastic, that um, carbon acquisition genes are differently regulated with changing um, carbon dioxide concentrations. And so there is some suggestion that, you know, these organisms are, are doing well in, in high CO2 environments, but, but kind of the nature of that change is still, I think, an area of ongoing research. Um, so this figure from um, O'Neill at all 2012, right, has this question mark around, you know, increasing CO2, decreasing pH, and whether or not that will enhance um, cyanobacterial HABs. And I think that this is, is still kind of an ongoing question. Um, when it comes to more of the population and community dynamics, we do see that toxic and non-toxic microcystis strains um, can have different competitive outcomes depending on carbon dioxide and light conditions. Uh, a different genus, Delicate Spermum, um, has been shown to increase growth and toxicity, but actually not dependent on CO2, more relative to changes and in increases in temperature. So again, this is still kind of an, an interesting and important area of ongoing research. If we then try and scale out from kind of the individual to population, response to OA, we can start to um, gain some insights into the community and ecosystem responses. Um, if, we, if we broaden our view from HABs to looking at changes in phytoplankton communities, um, there are some, some really great um, long-term mesocosm experiments that have shown under high CO2, you often get an increase in biomass, um, so kind of more propensity for you know, bloom-level um, biomass conditions. You also can see increases in some of the smaller organisms. So the pico eukaryotes in this um, Bach et al. paper were, were generally the winners in these high CO2, low pH treatments. If we um, focus in again on the Gulf of Mexico and some work again out of um, Bell's lab at LSU, um, they brought in phytoplankton communities from two Louisiana estuaries and um, incubated them at uh, ambient and, and higher CO2 conditions for four months. And, and what they found is there was actually multiple transitional states in the community composition um, within those mesocosms over this incubation period. Um, all of them were, dom all but one were dominated by cyanobacteria at the end, but a lot of them also started with a lot of cyanobacteria. Uh, generally, they saw a loss in diversity, but again, there were no real deterministic shifts from, you know, community one to community two uh, with this increase in carbon dioxide. But I think as we consider, you know, how communities are, are evolving, are responding to changes in CO2, we have to take kind of a longer-term approach, too. And so this is work um, not from the Gulf of Mexico, but looking, again, at kind of community-level responses, looking at competition among xenoflagellates. Uh, two, two HAB species, Lingulodinium and Alexandrium, were included in this um, experiment. And if you incubate those communities for two weeks, you do see these pie charts are showing kind of the differential um, relative abundances of these, these xenoflagellate taxa. You do see changes in, in who wins, right? So shifting from Lingulodinium kind of taking over at low CO2 to a little bit more, um, more of the, the Alexandrium and other species um, in that higher CO2 treatment. Interestingly, a lot of these dinos grew better um, when they were grown together, which again brings up questions around mixotrophy, facilitation, or even allelopathy that we're, we're not necessarily fully understanding. What this, um, what this experiment, what this study did a little bit differently than, than most is then recompeted those taxa after allowing them to acclimate and, and adapt to these higher CO2, these different CO2 conditions. And you can see just from, you know, the broad view of, of these pie charts how differently those competition um, experiments uh, ended. And so the competitive outcomes change a lot when, when you actually take into account adaptation um, of these species. 
some of the work that um, Astrid and my group are, have been doing in the Gulf of Mexico in collaboration with um, the GOMEX three crews was to look at um, natural communities throughout um, the Gulf of Mexico. So this is a cruise track of the GOMEX three crews in um, 2017 and trying to not just look at who is there and how much but also what that means for um, rates of, of grazing, food webs, and carbon flow. Um, just a few of the experiments, and I apologize, I still have a, a wonky ellipse, but um, we generally see, you know, not super surprising trends, kind of higher um, onshore biomass than off. Oh, this slide's all weird. My apologies. Um, but then, but then, of course, we do see some of these exceptional conditions, specifically in line three, that Louisiana line where we have still really high biomass further offshore, as well as um, off the Yucatan where um, that biomass is also quite high in the inshore water. Um, and this, again, if you think back to the Gomez paper, is where we see more of those high DIC um, surface conditions. So, um, how do we tease apart kind of potential uh, enhancement of growth because of OA or that eutrophication piece in this, this system? If we go into a little bit more detail, we can um, see that by and large, these um, uh, northern Gulf of Mexico communities are dominated by really small cells, similar to what the, the box paper saw with the pico eukaryotes kind of winning in high CO2 conditions. And we also see a significant contribution, especially as we move um, offshore and into the Western Gulf, from uh, some of those heterotrophic and mixotrophic members of the phytoplankton. Um, these do include some of the taxa. I'm not showing that um, in, in detail right now. But, but again, we need to keep in mind um, not just you know overall phytoplankton biomass, but what sizes, what nutritional modes, and how do we understand these trends relative to these different stressors. If we want to um, then broaden our view a little bit more from the community to kind of the food web uh, perspective, again, we, we have a fair bit of information at this smaller scale, right? Understanding so this figure from Karen and Hutchins lays out kind of the different players that we would need to understand in plankton food webs. And, and we have some insights here, some great meta-analysis. Um, this great meta these great meta-analyses have shown not only what you can expect to see, but also that there's, that there's a huge amount of variance in, in terms of what a diatom or a diazotroph or a toxic cyanobacteria or, or dinoflagellate um, exper uh, experiences with increasing OA. But we have not as many um, insights. We have a lot more, um, a, a lot larger gap in our knowledge when we start to think of these higher trophic levels. Um, so if we think about that a little bit more, you know, one of the things that, that I've already uh, talked about a bit is that the importance of considering mixotrophy in these HAB taxa, these HAB species ecology. And, and we, don't, we don't really incorporate that right now into a lot of um, the experimental work out there. Um, if we look at kind of translations from group or species level changes through communities and into higher trophic levels, there are some, um, some experiments out there, a lot of which have, have incorporated um, uh, sorry, uh, mesocosm approaches. Um, my apologies. Uh, what used to be called Chattanella and is now Vistacitus, which I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correct, is no longer a phytophyte. So my apologies for the typo. That will be fixed in the, um, the final uh, slide. But, but this uh, Rivasil paper from a long-term mesocosm study found that high CO2 supported growth and prolonged a bloom of, of this, um, this pad species. As a result, and you can see that down here in this lower um, graph, as, a, as they also saw during these mesocosms with prolonged blooms that we had that they had lower um, micro and mesozoplankton biomass, they also saw decreases in particle flux. So changes that are occurring at, at the species and population level are are impacting these higher um, trophic levels and ecosystem um, functions such as carbon and particle export. If we broaden our view to some more non-HAB studies, um, we can see some of some of these similar um, 
impact as well. Although in this case, high CO2, um, also a set of mesocosm experiments, um, high CO2 enhanced the biomass of smaller copepods um, by a substantial amount. This was attributed to more of that increase in primary production. So we have to understand how changes at, again, the population community level are echoing through the food web. And then um, in Louisiana, we can't think about estuaries without thinking about oysters. And in a lot of our coastal systems where, um, where we have HABs, we also have important shellfish populations and other consumers. Um, some, some nice work has, has shown that not only are oyster larvae negatively impacted by CO2, but that that impact is exacerbated when the quantity or quality of that of the food that they're being given is low. And so in um, this Hedinger paper, they saw additive effects of high CO2 and, and low food availability on um, the percent of larvae metamorphosing. So um, I'll just summarize briefly. I, th I think that um, my goal for today was to give a little bit of, of the background on um, ocean acidification and HABs in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we have a diversity of HAB species. We also have a diversity of physical um, drivers that are influencing OA in the Gulf. Um, when we look at the more specific uh, information about OA and HABs and, and how HAB, HAB species tend to respond, most are experiencing enhanced growth at higher CO2 in lab experiments. However, that toxicity response is variable, and we really haven't, um, haven't been able to test some of these outcomes in the field. Um, secondly, you know, if we expand from the species level to communities, to populations and communities, um, there are suggestions that, and there's a fair bit of evidence that you can see changes in community structure, you can see changes in those competitive outcomes, um, some of our data from the Gulf of Mexico is highlighting um, the importance of, you know, those shifts to smaller size members of the phytoplankton community and also the importance of some of these members of the quote-unquote phytoplankton that actually might be doing um, some different nutritional, some different things nutritionally. And finally, um, this, this sequence from understanding at the species or organismal level to um, populations, communities, and ultimately uh, food webs and ecosystem function is still an area of, of I think, a lot of rich opportunity for, for research, um, especially if we can do those at relative time scales that take into account things like um, uh, lags in, in bloom initiation versus, you know, when they become an issue on the Gulf Coast of Florida, for example, or ties um, across multiple years with um, changes in river input to uh, the Mississippi River and what that means for Lake Pontchartrain cyanobacteria bloom. So, um, but there's a lot more, um, I think, research that needs to be done at this kind of community to ecosystem um, level. And so I was asked to put together some grand challenges in the Gulf questions. Um, I will I'll flip forward just for a second to uh, my acknowledgments and say thank you. I'm really happy to be able to share some of some of what we're doing in the Gulf and some of what I think as a community we, we still could do. Um, and I will end with some of these, these grand challenges in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, just to kind of summarize, this first, this first one is really about, you know, we, we have a system with a lot of different uh, uh, OA variability, but also diversity of HAP. How do we best um, approach understanding the system? Do we, you know, really zero in on certain regions or taxa, or can we take a Gulf-wide approach? Um, these, the second two, so number two and three, are really around more, you know, attributing um, effects to OA versus other coast stressors and also disentangling direct and indirect effects of OA on food web dynamics. Um, I know that some of these questions have been shared in some of the previous uh, webinars as well, especially when it comes to OA versus coast stressors. And then finally, I think as we as we better understand the ecology of the HAB species themselves, especially some of these um, nutritional modes that, that put them along this continuum between autotroph and heterotroph, um, can we better understand uh, how these, these groups are responding um, if we allow them to exist along that continuum? And with that, I will um, stop talking and take questions. Thank you so much, Beth. I just would like to point everyone's attention down to the poll, which can be located next to the captioning pod.
um, and there you can um, let us know how strongly you agree or disagree with Beth's brand challenges. And also, if you have any questions for Beth, please take the time to write them in the chat box. If you have any comments for her uh, related to her grand challenges, um, you can also enter those in the chat box. Um, Maya will be reading the questions from the chat box, and we will unmute you as the question is read, so that if you have any follow-up questions or comments, um, you can continue that conversation with the speaker. If others want to comment or continue um, the thread of a discussion on a particular question, please raise your hand, and we will try to unmute you, unmute you if time permits. Um, we ask that you try to keep the discussion for each question to two to three minutes so that the speaker can address all questions. And all questions will be recorded, so if we don't get to your question today, it will be compiled for discussion at the online workshop in August. We also ask that each of you answer a few questions on the content of the webinar via the Google form, which will be um, in the chat box. And this form is also a good place to add any of your comments that we don't get to during discussion. We plan on using the Google form responses to help guide our discussions at the workshop and also to help inform future research funding directions. So it's really important that you participate in that as well. So Maya, why don't you take it away with the questions that we have? Thank you, Erica, for your presentation. No, thank you, Erica, and thank you, Beth, for your presentation. Our first question is from Beth Turner. Uh, she said, Beth, you've laid out um, a lot of complexities of the Gulf system and mentioned needs for studies over generations and using communities rather than signal species. I wonder how many is enough and how many can we expect to get in experimental studies? That's a great question, Beth, and it's, you know, one that I think we all say, oh, we need to include more complexity, but that gets very messy very fast, um, as I think anyone who's done this with experiments knows. Um, I think that that approach needs to be based in hypotheses. So, for example, when we consider um, Karenia brevis, including um, some of its potential prey as a mixotrope, or including things like Trichodesmium as a facilitating species, uh, could be you know, maybe the first step towards that um, in, in moving from more single species based into, you know, in that case, maybe just one or two other species. Uh, I think basing it in, in kind of dominant com com competitors or co-occurring species is another one. And, and of course, um, moving from doing experiments, you know, in the lab with kind of synthetic communities to doing more of those kind of natural community mesocosms, um, bringing them, you know, onto a ship or into a lab and, and following those um, communities over time um, is, is another way of, of approaching that. Of course, you know, if you're on a ship, you're not going to do a six-month or 12-month or experiment, but, um, but I think figuring out how we can better leverage and utilize the opportunities that we do have to work with natural communities and to also work with some of these species that we know are important for one another um, are is maybe how we move towards that. Thank you, Beth. And we have another question from Erica. She asked, how species specific are these mixed trophy relationships? And can they switch prey items to whatever is available, or are they very specific? very species-specific? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think one that we probably are learning better answers to um, every year with kind of the burgeoning, you know, it's been existing for a while, but definitely growing kind of field of, of research into mixotrophy. Um, so, for example, with um, Dinophysis, uh, they tend to be somewhat species-specific around Marionetta rubra, but they can also feed on other ciliates that are kind of similarly sized. Um, a lot of it can often come down to that, that size piece as well. So it may not necessarily be a matter of having to look at, you know, that specific potential prey item, but, all, but maybe looking at kind of a suite of, of potential prey items based on size, based on um, what we know about those, those ecologies. Uh, the other thing about mixotrophy is that, you know, we can talk about all, you know, more or less all dinoflagellates being 
putatively mixotrophic at this point. Um, we know that they are capable of that, but the conditions that kind of lead them to, you know, a little more heterotrophy versus more autotrophy um, is, is still very dependent on, on what's going on in that environment. So even if you see a quote-unquote mixotrophic dinoflagellate, it may not actually be, you know, ingesting that many heterotrophic prey if nutrients, light, et cetera, are, are you know, in, abund in abundance. So I think better um, understanding how how these putative mixotrophs are operating in the natural setting um, is kind of another way of, of getting, and, and maybe in the lab, seeing if OA represents a, a stressor or a, a trigger in terms of mixotrophy um, could be another way of, of approaching, of tackling that, that question. Thank you. And our next comment following a question is from Yuyun Z. And they stated, for studies with natural communities, I have a question. Is OA experiment in bottles unrealistic for dinoflagellates? Because I think thou vertical mi migration is critical for them in competition with other classes. How can we improve the experimental setting? Uh, another excellent question, and about dinoflagellates, which are wonderful, right? Um, yeah, so vertical migration, dial vertical migration in dinoflagellates is, is hugely important for how they're um, accessing, you know, light nutrients and, and other things in, in nature. Um, typically, I think when, when ball experiments are done with replete, you know, nutrients and light, um, some of that migration can be not as important. However, they do tend to still kind of undergo those kind of rhythmic um, uh, migrations. I think that the a lot of the experiments where we've seen kind of really interesting kind of community or even food web outcomes have largely not been small bottle based, but more of that mesocosm approach. And so in that mesocosm approach, you do kind of maintain that vertical water column for um, these these sorts of parts of, of that, of those organisms' physiology and, and um, ecology and, you know, motility, ultimately. So I think that uh, maybe some of those larger mesocosm approaches are, um, are valuable. Um, I also know that they're, you know, they're beasts. Like, you don't just go out and do that without, you know, a significant amount of funding and, and a fair bit of, of know-how. Um, but I think that moving from kind of lab-based kind of bottle experiments to larger volumes and ultimately to kind of mesocosm approaches is a, a nice way of tackling that. And I guess I would add on one thing to that, that answer is that not just dial vertical migration, but also these allelopathic effects, right, on um, some of the co-occurring species is, is also one of the things that, that you would need to kind of disentangle from toxicity from growth, from some of those other changes um, in these populations. Thank you. If you guys have more questions for our speakers, please go ahead and enter them in the chat box now. If you haven't yet had a chance um, to answer the poll question, now would be a great time to um, respond to the poll. If we don't have any more questions for our speaker today, then I think you can wrap up. Um, I just want to let everyone know that we will be posting a recording of today's webinar and the PDF slides on our workshop webpage, which will be posted in the chat box right there. And the Google form is also listed there. So please take a few minutes now, since we're giving you about 10 extra minutes, to click on that Google form link and um, help us uh, as we create our priorities for our um, ocean certification and harmful algal bloom workshop in August. Our next webinar is going to be Friday, July 10th.
um, focusing on Great Lakes and ocean acidification and has in the Great Lakes. Um, and that will be at 1.30 Eastern time. Thank you for joining us.